Jackson and the Savannah River Channel.
numerous archaeological investigations throughout the southeastern United States. She has been with the Army, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers since 2010 in various capacities, including as Chief Curator for the Corps' Mandatory Center of Expertise in Curation and Management of Archaeological Collections, of the breath, um, and, and also Program Manager for the Veterans Curation Program. Ms. Farmer currently serves as an archaeologist for the Savannah District, and in this uh, role, she is the cultural resources lead for various projects and studies, including the Savannah Harbor Expansion Project, which you're going to hear about this evening. Ms. Farmer will say a few words about that project in light of the archaeological dis discoveries being uh, discussed this evening. And, uh, would you like to stand up and show everybody who you are? Yeah. Uh, Andrew Farmer, archaeologist. <laughs> <laughs> and then also here this evening, um, is Knoxville, Tennessee-based filmmaker, Mr. Michael Jordan, who has produced more than 30 films about Savannah area history um, and also archaeology, including the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers educational film about the raising of a Civil War ironclad warship at CSS Georgia. Mr. Jordan's uh, previous work has been honored with an Edward R. Murrow Award, the Georgia Associated Press Best Documentary Award, and a regional Emmy nomination. He's also the author of three books about Savannah history and contributed a chapter to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers official archaeological report on the raising of the CSS Georgia. Mr. Jordan will be showing a clip this evening, or actually several clips this evening, from his filming of the current project's fieldwork in the Savannah River. So in addition, tonight's speakers include Mr. William Wilson and Mr. Stephen James. At the Commonwealth Heritage Group Incorporated, Mr. William Wilson is head of geophysical and remote sensing survey and directs most field operations for its maritime division. Mr. Wilson has conducted numerous investigations across the eastern United States and the Caribbean, including both underwater and terrestrial projects, and he was instrumental in the recent recovery of the Confederate ironclad CSS Georgia in the Savannah River. Mr. Stephen James is Director of Commonwealth Heritage's Group Maritime Division. He has over 30 years' experience as a maritime archaeologist. Mr. James has directed and managed submerged archaeological projects of all types throughout the United States, the Caribbean, and the Pacific, including the search for World War II shipwrecks and aircraft. Having worked extensively with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Savannah District, over the years, he recently directed the recovery of the Confederate ironclad CSS Georgia. So, shoot, without, <laughs> before I introduce you to the speaker, your cell phone reminded me, I'm sorry. Um, somebody lost a hotel key card. If you can come up and tell me what hotel it's for, you get the prize. And somebody else seems to have lost some keys. If you could tell me how many keys they are, I'll give them back to you. So, just, you can see me at the end. Okay, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Let them come up, come forward, for the introduction. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight on behalf of the Savannah District. We're just so excited to be able to share about this incredible discovery. Um, and our talk is on cannons and cribs, two recent revolutionary and Civil War site discoveries in the Savannah River. So really to start, I have to talk a little bit about the Savannah Harbor Expansion Project because without it, we would not be here tonight. Uh, the project is a, a large deepening project. So you can see here on the slide, there's a very large cargo ship. Well, for the Savannah Port, they want to deepen the harbor so that we can have uh, so even more river commerce, larger car cargo ships coming into the city. And it's gonna bring some really incredible benefits to the, the Savannah area. So um, I will go ahead and proceed to the next slide because this is what we're here for tonight, the two cannon. So how did we end up finding 15 Revolutionary War cannon in the river? Um, as part of the, the techniques that they use of dredging in this area, what they would do is take a clamshell dredge that um, basically scoops up debris on the riverbed. Um, and that's in preparation for a cutter head dredge to come through. Now keep in mind, this is in the area where the CSS Georgia was scuttled during the Civil War. So there is untold number of munitions down there. So one, this is kind of a, a safety issue for those materials to be down there, but also it could severely damage the equipment. So they used the cutter head to go down there, scoop up the material, and then they would deposit it on a scow, which is the metal, um, 
feed the bit machinery that has the bars on it. And what would happen is that debris, um, small things would drop through the bars, and then at the top you would have the debris. You can see a tire, some wood, some cement, rocks. And uh, one morning I woke up to an email that said uh, they had found a cannon um, through landfill dredging. Then that afternoon, um, after I'm going to go ahead and proceed to the next slide, so you can see on this slide um, the location where they found the original cannon, and then the second location where they found additional cannons, very close together. But they felt that they had moved far enough <coughs> down in the river that they were like, you know, there's nothing here. You know, the CSS Georgia had been in this area. It's probably just a Civil War cannon. Um, it, you know, we'll just keep moving on. Well, when they pulled up the two additional cannon, I got a text that just said two cannon and had a photo of them. And I did not know the person well at that time, Bert. I don't think he's here tonight. Um, but I could tell the tone from his text. This was a big deal. Um, we knew that something was going on. So then they moved the dredge even farther down the river um, where the red dot is that says wooden items. I don't know who was operating the dredge on that day, but they should have played the lottery because they ended up pulling up even more artifacts. So there were wooden uh, beams that had uh, brass pins in them. And we're like, what, what do we have here? Is it a shipwreck, multiple shipwrecks? What's going on? Um, so the Savannah District, even though there's this huge, over $700 million project was put on hold so that we could investigate these sites. So the Savannah District, um, it really embraces its responsibility under law and regulation like the National Historic Preservation Act. And we, we put a hold on everything, and then we hired a team of experts to come in and investigate this area. So that's how we had uh, Commonwealth Heritage Groups come, come in to do sonar surveys, so re using remote sensing technologies diver investigations, and then eventually the recovery efforts. I'll talk a little bit more um, this evening on well, what are we gonna actually do with these materials later on, but first, um, I will turn it over to them. So thank you again for coming tonight. Okay, so I'm Will Wilson. I'm the uh, dirtiest guy. Usually I'm one of the ones out in the field, uh, and I do I cover the geophysical survey. Sometimes we call it uh, remote sensing. Um, and here you can see we've got three instruments along the bottom. Uh, and it's obviously, if you've seen the Savannah River, it's not clear. It's not the Caribbean. Um, so we really are sensing things remotely. Uh, and each one of these sensors tell us something different. Uh, none of them are image-based. The first one uh, is the sonar, the side scan sonar. Uh, and now you can get them on your boat. So it's not as crazy out there as it used to be, but it's still a little bit high tech. Uh, but anyway, it, it sends out sound information laterally. And what you get in the end, actually, I, I know it said it's not visual, but it does look like a picture, uh, kind of like a black and white picture. Um, you're getting echoes back, it comes back to the transducer. And um, yeah, you get light, you know, high, high points, you get shadows when things are sticking up off the bottom. So, and that ended up being, as you'll see later, uh, kind of our most important sensor um, for doing the remote sensing in this area. Uh, the second is a sub-bottom profiler. If you've been on a boat and you've had a, a, a fish finder, this is like a really high-powered fish finder that can penetrate through the bottom so you can see things underneath. Uh, it's not great for finding shipwrecks. We really use it more for finding um, submerged landscapes. Things that, you know, used to be exposed uh, landforms for finding uh, prehistoric or pre-contact sites, um, uh, but the geology, basically, that's, that's more for that. But occasionally we can use it to tie in things uh, like shipwrecks. Uh, and the last one on the right is the magnetometer. This is normally most underwater archaeologists' favorite tool. Uh, it tells us when there's ferrous metals, iron, steel, um, and a few others, anything that's magnetically susceptible. But uh, when things are buried, you, you're not going to see it with the, the first sonar. Uh, if you're lucky, you'll get it with the middle one, but that last one, anything generating uh, a deflection in the magnetic field, so again, you got a, a, a big mass of iron, it'll pick it up, and so uh, that's normally great. However, the Savannah River is just full of junk. Uh, yeah. it's, it's all sorts of stuff, up until very recently, if you had something break on a ship, you just tossed it overboard. Uh, 
uh, they're a little more aware that that's a bad idea now, but uh, for hundreds of years it was done, so um, as you'll see, it, it, did, it wasn't as useful, but it did give us a, a clue into things. Uh, this illustrates what we call the discovery area. So Andrew talked about you have the area uh, towards the southwest where we found the cannons or where they were recovered. Uh, and then further down the river, which is northeast in this uh, image, um, they had wooden artifacts. So we created a, a survey cell um, to, to run those sensors and uh, just to cover the entirety of the area. If there was anything out there, uh, we wanted to find it. And um, the image on the right, that's showing uh, the sonar mosaic. So it's, it's a little zoomed out here, but we'll show some other images to give you a better idea. But um, it looks sort of like a zoomed out photo. I mean, it's kind of, you know, if you took the uh, satellite image and made it the same color tones, it would almost blend together. Um, and then, you, I know you can't see the numbers, but then we have the targets that we picked out, again, primarily from that side scan sonar uh, from doing that survey. And, uh, oh yeah, and on the left, so the, this is its survey, you know, we're, we're trying to be uh, systematic about it. Each one of those blue lines is a transect, and so we call it mowing the lawn, but you know, you're, you're going at about, you know, four miles an hour, and just check them all, you've got your three instruments in the water, and you just, you run until it's done, but in order to get good data, you've got your GPS that's giving positions for your different sensors in the water, that's the, the way to run it. Okay, so with the side scan sonar, we, we identified anything, again, we're looking for linear, um, objects because we're looking for cannon primarily uh, other things anchors and whatever else uh, shipwreck material but um, especially in the area where they recovered the cannon we wanted to know where every single one was we don't want to miss any um, that image in the upper left great image of a cannon uh, you can see the muzzle flare on the bottom left and uh, kind of see the breach in the upper right except it's not a cannon at all uh, it's a concrete piling, and uh, this was the most cannon of all the targets we had. Um, and, uh, wow, it's way out there, it's big, you know, it's bigger than the other cannons, and then he, he, the guy's feeling around on the bottom, he's like, it's really square. Um, so, yeah, these things are out there. Uh, and then logs, um, the dredging they're doing right now with the clamshells, it's just constantly, you know, that break she showed, it's just full of logs. Um, it's a strong tide, so things get pushed around. Um, but here we have what is clearly an anchor, and it actually was an anchor. Um, and this is uh, this was just recently recovered from the dredging. So some of these targets that were out and around, not necessarily in the vicinity of the cannon, um, they're now collected. And, you know, we're able to document them uh, after the fact. But uh, again, it's a very useful tool for this. We know. We have an idea of what we're looking for before the dive gets in there. The magnetometer, again, you can kind of sense things that are buried, but you might not have any idea what you'd be going after except the fact that it's steel or iron. And here's an image of three cannon. Um, so you can see kind of a, a white stripe, vertical, the long shadow, and then there's two cannon, and you can see just to the bottom right of that. Um, and we've got two long guns and one short gun, which we'll explain a little bit more later, represented there. But, but this is, again, what we were looking for. So anything that was cannon-like, we, we went after. Um, now, I showed three sensors, but there really was a fourth one. And this is kind of the coolest to most people. Uh, it's a multi-beam echo sounder. So if you've got, um, you know, again, a fish finder, you're getting the bottom on there. You know how deep the water is. Uh, multi-beam does a bunch of those at the same time, a bunch of sonar beams out, and in the end, instead of having you know, a few transects of depths or soundings, you have a 3D point cloud, which you can turn into a surface, you can move around, zoom in on everything else, and uh, if it's uh, high resolution, you can get really detailed information from it. So we went to the multi-beam data in the area, and um, this was almost more useful than the side scan. Actually, I, I would say it was more useful in this case than the side scan. Um, the only problem, like with the side scan, things have to be above the bottom. It's not gonna pick up anything underneath. But we've got, you can clearly see what looks like five cannon in this image on the right. It's actually six. Uh, one of the cannon was directly underneath uh, another. I don't know how it happened, but uh, especially getting kicked around by dredges over the years, but there you go. OK, 
in addition to the cannon site, we were investigating the uh, Confederate crib obstructions, uh, and these were just down the river of the CSS Georgia site. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll get more into the details, but basically just obstruction. They were quickly built uh, and filled with rubble to stand in the way. But this is a multi-beam image as well. And this is where you can kind of see where they're a little more interesting to look at for uh, a lay person especially, but um, it's been tilted. North is going up to the uh, upper right. And you have A, B, C, and D. Those are representing four different cribs. Um, and with color scheme, so the blue is the deepest sounding, so we've got the channel towards the bottom. And you can see it's, it's kind of sheer. This has been exaggerated a little bit, but it's pretty close to accurate. I think it's only two times uh, the exaggeration. Um, and then as you get higher, you get into the red, so you can kind of clearly see the, the peaks on each of the obstructions. Once we go through the data, there's a, you know, we collect the data, and then there's a processing aspect that takes time. Uh, and then we analyze it after the data's been processed and pick out all the targets. Um, once we've got the targets, then we can do the fun stuff. And so this is uh, an example. This is uh, the CBS dive cruise boat, um, Skipper 2. And we just we go to each of the targets. There, there was a, uh, a prioritizing of, of targets, things obviously that we knew were logged or something. We don't want to waste our time on that. But uh, anything that looked like a cannon we went after, anchors, that sort of thing. Um, the, it's not scuba. Uh, I, you, you know, it's this is hard hat. This is uh, kind of it's a newer form of uh, really old technology. But while we're wearing scuba tanks, that's really like an emergency air system. Your air's coming from the surface, but you've also got complete uh, communication constantly with the uh, topside folks, um, which allows you to as the diver to not have to think as much. Um, but also, it allows the people on top, we had uh, positioning on the divers, so we knew where they were. Um, so you could be directed, because the diver can't see anything down there. Uh, at best, I think we'd get maybe, we may have had a foot and a half on a couple of days, but for the most part, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. So they're telling you where to go, and then you can get the measurements, whatever information you need to get that top side. Uh, in addition to not being able to see anything, um, we have plenty of other issues that are pretty specifically bad in the uh, Savannah River. Um, really large freighters. Uh, this is one of the busiest ports I know of that we've ever worked in. Um, and unfortunately, the cannon side is square in the middle of the channel. And if you're on a little dive boat, you know, you can guess who wins that chicken fight. Um, but it's not just you know, we were in contact with the pilots, and um, so we knew when ships were passing through. Uh, unfortunately, we're not just scheduling around them. You can only dive at slack tide, so you've got the flood and the ebb. And, you know, at peak high or peak low, everything slows down, and then it just stops before it reverses. And that's the only time where it's diveable. Uh, outside of that, the current's so strong, you just get up and you know you're flapping like a flag you can't get anything done but you can't even really get to the bottom um, and this image on the right shows uh, we just had an extreme tide uh, one of the days and I think we couldn't dive for like three days um, the, the slack was basically non-existent so there just was no window so you get uh, most days maybe one hour where you could get in the water maybe two if there were two windows and then you also had to align with the, uh, the freighter traffic. So it was, it was difficult, but uh, we, we got our days in. Okay, so this is showing the cluster of artifacts on the, on the left there. You can see Dr. Cannon 1 and 2 and then all those others. That's the, uh, the Cannon site and then the Confederate Crib site, uh, which is actually in South Carolina. The Cannon site belongs to Georgia. The Confederate cribs are just on the South Carolina side, um, and so we're, we're actually dealing with two different states for those sites. But you can see where they are in relation to Fort Jackson. They're not that far apart, but um, two different jurisdictions. This is a, a map from uh, just after uh, the Civil War, and this sort of puts the whole landscape in perspective. Um, you got a box illustrating where the CSS Georgia is. <laughs> Uh, and then the Confederate crib, crib obstructions uh, just down the river. And of course you have Fort Jackson, so they're kind of working in concert to keep people from coming up river. Um, and then just some additional 
wrecks that were charted uh, on that map. Um, the uh, Confederate crib obstructions themselves are pretty highly degraded uh, at this point, and that's not just from time. Um, obviously, they wanted to open the port back up after the war uh, so they could you know, make some money, eventually use the river for what they were using for before. Um, and so they had their own uh, demolition, you know, and surprisingly, I mean, they had divers back then, they had, uh, you know, pretty heavy duty machinery to pull that stuff down. So that's part of the whole process. It's not just, you know, wood degrading from tornado worms and everything else. It's, it was actively removed. So what we're dealing with now is what's left. Um, so even though it is highly degraded, uh, it's still been recommended eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. Um, like the CSS Georgia is on the register. So um, the other wrecks on there, they just sort of just show you what's going on and not necessarily related to this project. But uh, anyway, that sets us up for this, uh, this next, we're gonna show a video that Michael Jordan produced um, related to the uh, Confederate clips. archaeologist with Commonwealth Heritage Group currently managing an important project here in Savannah for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We're studying relics of the Civil War hidden beneath the waters of the Savannah River. Following Union victories early in the war, Savannah's Confederate defenders needed to block the Savannah River so the U.S. Navy vessels could not steam up and attack the city. To accomplish this goal, Confederate engineers built rows of what they called cribs, essentially big, tall wooden boxes filled with bricks and rocks which the Confederates towed out into the river and sank just below the surface. These obstructions made it impossible for any Union forces to reach Savannah, and even now, more than 150 years later, a few of the Confederate cribs remain in the murky waters of the Savannah River. This month, archaeological divers from Commonwealth Heritage Group, contracted by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, are conducting a detailed survey of four of the surviving cribs, our field work began in early October with a sonar sweep of the submerged structures. Now we are plunging into the cold, dark waters on every slack tide to make detailed physical examinations. Working from the research vessel Parker, our team includes archaeological hard hat divers as well as a professional support team on the surface. We use a real-time video connection and an audio link to communicate with the diver working below. Oh yeah, yeah, I can see it pretty clearly. How far out ahead is it? The sonar map from October helps us guide the divers to the right spot on the bottom. Now pump on the boat pushes a jet of high-powered water so the divers can clear away sediments and expose the wooden structures they can see. No one has touched this in at least 100, no, over 150 years or so. That wall broke off and what we're seeing, what we thought was planned view, like, you know, we're, we're seeing it as it was, uh, is actually, it's fallen over 90 degrees. When we're finished, the information we have painstakingly collected from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers will answer questions about how the obstructions were constructed and reveal new details about this hidden aspect of Savannah Civil War history. Uh, the historic uh, map. Employing that, 
and the um, also on the maps there were the construction drawings of these cribs. So uh, our intent was uh, in documenting these cribs was to correlate and contrast and compare uh, to the historical document. Um, and uh, as far as crib D, we were looking, we were we uncovered uh, what would be the corner on the left. You can see the uh, the corner. Uh, uh, construction and on crib C, all that was left was the lowest uh, uh, layer of what would be shown on the on the right uh, uh, figure. And here's crib D. You can see the uh, once again it's the multi beam image. Uh, the orange is just scattered brick. It's all deflated. Uh, they they probably stood. And we don't know specifically because we don't know the exact water depth. But the, these uh, cribs were 40 foot square and approximately that high, maybe not quite that high. Um, the, uh, we don't know if they were exposed at both low and high tide, but they were probably exposed at low tide. That's, a, that's a, an assumption on our part we do not know. But again, crib B, in comparing and contrasting what's left on site, uh, and all we had was one section of it, which was the corner. And basically, it was an exact mirror image to the, the historic uh, uh, map. Now, crib C, on the other hand, uh, we didn't have a corner, but what we had was the lowest level of the crib. And uh, we, we show where it's at on that crib. And you can see the, uh, the dark area that is, uh, those are planks. And what we have is on top of the planks, it was tons of bricks that we dug through. And then underneath the planks, it was sterile sand and uh, Miocene clay, which is the base of the river. And that basically told us we were at the bottom of the crib. And it, and it, and it uh, compared completely with, not quite this drawing, this just shows you where it's at within the structure, but on the previous drawing that shows you that it indeed was plank. Uh, and that was basically the documentation of the cribs. They, uh, they're currently dredging uh, the channel. They have taken most, if not all, of Crib D away. Uh, it's no longer extant. And what we, you know, as archaeologists, we go in and we effectively document things, uh, and then they can be destroyed. Uh, they can be taken away because we have the documentation in hand. And that's why we do this, so they can uh, widen the channel. And, and shown here is the red line. That's the wider, and they go up slope, and they've taken out Crib D. They will not uh, uh, approach or touch Crib C. It's intact. Uh, but basically, there's very little of the cribs left. Uh, they, they are recommended as eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. And uh, they effectively helped, along with the uh, CSS Georgia, which was just upstream, kept the Union at bay, uh, the Union fleet out of Savannah. Uh, and so Savannah could not be taken until Sherman effectively came in by land. So they're pretty significant. Documentation and recovery of the cannon scatter site. Um, Multi-beam on the left shows you uh, all the cannon that we uh, see on multi-beam, and they were initially discovered uh, with uh, the dredging, three cannon, all of the same type. And now I believe we will go into the video and watch that, and then we'll come back and talk more about the cannon. And is there a secret to this, Will? I'm going to just tap the mouse on top of the picture. Rare relics from an important period in early Georgia history rose from the Savannah River in January 2022 as archaeologists completed recovery of 15 cannon believed to be from more than one Revolutionary War shipwreck. The mystery first unfolded in late February 2021 when a dredge unexpectedly sucked up three iron guns and fragments of anchors at a deep spot in front of Old Fort Jackson known as Five Fathom Hole. It was a surprise. It was just completely unexpected. Uh, they thought that dredging had occurred in this area several times, and it was clear that it had, uh, but none of these materials had ever been brought up before. But there'd been so much dredging in the river uh, that mm, I don't think anybody really expected this. They've survived all the dredging. That was probably the biggest surprise. Early suspicions focused on the HMS Rose, 
a famous British warship intentionally sunk here in 1779. But research quickly discounted that possibility, since historical documents show the Rose was sunk further upriver, and more importantly, that all of her weapons were removed prior to sinking. British archives indicate that the weapons on the river bottom were actually the remains of two or more commercial vessels used to transport British troops, ships that were also sunk to block the river when a large enemy fleet suddenly appeared off Tybee Island. The French had blockaded the port of Savannah, uh, getting ready to, to attack. So they scuttled these troop transports to keep the French out and you know, basically save the city early on from being taken over. They plugged the channel to where the ships could not come in, come up, the French could not come up and take the city. Dredging in the area was halted, and sonar surveys revealed the presence of more than a dozen more cannons scattered on the river bottom at Five Fathom Hole. The Savannah District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers brought in a team of experts highly regarded for their earlier work raising the wreckage of the Civil War ironclad CSS Georgia nearby. They were already familiar with this territory, so they were the perfect fit for this project. Step one for the archaeologists from Commonwealth Heritage Group was to create a detailed map of the artifacts, combining sonar with hands-on measurements by trained archaeological divers. Hey, Jim, can you get us the measurement from the muzzle to that possible trunnion? <laughs> Then it was time for salvage divers from Savannah-based Commercial Dive and Marine Services to get to work bringing these historical artifacts to the surface. Dives in the middle of the busy shipping channel could only take place at high or low tide, and only if no freighters were passing overhead. And even then, the work was next to impossible. Putting the divers on the cannon was difficult. We had to use high-tech positioning equipment to, to get them back on things and make sure we're in the right location. But we had to uh, kind of run in and out when the tides and, and the vessel traffic ceased. Kind of when all the stars aligned. The tide turns and it turns like that. You got zero viz. The current's ripping you. You're, you're holding on for dear life half the time trying to, to hike your way through down there. It's been a race against the clock. Every time you get in the water, you're racing the clock. One by one, the divers managed to get sturdy slings beneath the heavy cannon. Then the team used inflatable lift bags to wrench the guns from the thick mud on the bottom. We add pressure to it, and uh, sometimes it takes a while for that cannon to work its way out of the mud. But once it surfaces, uh, we know we got it. We pull it in, tie it off to the boat, and move it. The cannon were gently placed back on the river bottom at a safe, shallow spot near Hutchinson Island while the recovery work continued. Then, on January 18, 2022, a big crane hoisted them out of the water and into metal troughs which were trucked the short distance over to the Corps of Engineers depot. Getting everything out of the water and taking away especially a lot of the uncertainties with dealing with vessel traffic, weather, and everything else that goes along with the environment out there. A big relief, big uh, breath of uh, fresh air. The next day, archaeologists and other experts spent hours taking a closer look at the artifacts. It's a little hard to make out, but I think I got it here. It uh, starts at 8 inches from center of Okay. and ends at 9. Basically, you look at the measurements and we always refer to a cannon by its total length. Total length is from after the cascable to the front of the muzzle face. And all these measurements can get put into a database and you compare them to known cannon from known cannon manufacturers. So you get more and more knowledge. And the more knowledge, knowledgeable you are, the more informed you are. Concealed beneath centuries of concretion were real surprises, even for these veteran archeologists. I had assumed every one of those cannons were nearly identical. Um, and now that we're measuring, we're starting to see some real differences. The river also yielded up other smaller but equally important artifacts, including several pieces of bar shot, a type of ammunition that looks a lot like a modern dumbbell. It's basically two half cannonballs with a bar in between them that are, you know, 12, 12 inches to 16 inches in, in length, and this thing spins through the air. If you fire into the rigging, it breaks all the rigging or it hits the, the mast of the ship. You've got a great chance of hitting the mast of the ship with a, with a bar. 
also recovered fragments of ship's hardware. The main artifacts you find there are anchors. Uh, we have so many pieces of anchors of all different sizes and shapes. It's, it's pretty amazing. The story is still unfolding. Once the research is complete, there's more work to be done. We are going to identify a few that will be great candidates for conservation, and we are going to try to conserve those. We hope that they will be put on exhibit locally in Savannah so that people can see them, and we're just interested to learn more about the story. So hopefully it'll shine a light on the Revolutionary War period in Savannah and how it was saved from the French. Reporting from Savannah, I'm Michael Jordan for the Savannah District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. scatter site. Um, it, uh, it's, it's right upstream from Fort Jackson. A uh, picture on the, on the uh, right, you can see Fort Jackson, you can see the cannon scatter. The, the Georgia is right kind of north of that. And that is an area known as Five Fathom Hole that we've come to find. And uh, in, in our initial research, the uh, this map right here uh, was um, uh, produced by or um, uh, drawn by the Admiral of the French Fleet, Admiral Estan, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name, but it basically shows uh, the, uh, the vessels in the harbor at the time. You can see uh, Savannah, those are all British vessels. You see one scuttled vessel just downstream from there that may or may not be the road. I think it's a little far down, but then the French fleet is all the way down just at and, and below Fort Jackson. Uh, you've got uh, vessels to the high north, that would be French as well, that come around, and but they could not come through that cut right there, which uh, we'll talk about here uh, shortly. Initial uh, thoughts by some was that the cannon originated from the HMS Rose. The HMS Rose being a um, fifth, uh, six rate frigate uh, 20 of 20 guns, fairly famous. It uh, initially uh, blockaded the uh, Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island early on in the war, which was one of the main import locations for gunpowder, which the uh, American forces, the rebels, uh, dearly needed and were very short of. The Rose played a significant role in staunching the flow of of uh, power into the into the colonies. Here was another uh, role it played in the uh, battles along the Hudson River to basically drive Washington and his troops out of New York. But our initial thoughts were, were not my thoughts, but initially people thought it might be the Rose. But in doing our research, the historic maps uh, show that the uh, rose pictured here, it's the same, the lower panel is an excerpt of the upper panel, and the upper panel shows the city of Savannah, you can see all the little parks that are, uh, uh, are still here, the most beautiful you know, city of along the coast, in, in my opinion. But you see the gun emplacements, the earthenworks around the city. The, uh, the uh, arrow points to the location of the rose, which uh, in the excerpt is right here, English frigate Ro rose was sunk. We, uh, and the actual documents tell us that it was sunk in the Rex Channel, which we know to be near the city of Savannah, not down towards Fort Jackson. The um, documents also sh state that all of her guns were removed and put on the, the gun emplacements, the earthenworks around the city, and her sailors manned the guns. Um, the, um, the guns were put in place, the American forces were coming by land, the French fleet was coming by the river. And its scuttling there disallowed the French from coming through Rex Channel uh, and bombarding the city, thereby assisting the rebel forces and uh, effectively turning the tide in the battle of at the Siege of Savannah, which uh, uh, some say may be the bloodiest battle in the uh, revolution. And her guns, uh, 
we have an earthen work, I believe, that's out this door, it's out on the, this side of the museum. Uh, heck, the rose guns could have been all on that earthen work right here. But they were somewhere around the city. But uh, discounting the rose, we come to uh, the fact that we know that the HMB, His Majesty's Brig Savannah, which was a 14 gun brig, um, it was scuttled with all her guns and she had at least 14. Um, and potentially all, the armed transport Venus and a couple of other transports, they were sunk at five fathom hole, which you can see in the lower uh, panel is just opposite uh, Fort Jackson. You can see the, the, the name five fathom hole, or exactly five fathom hole, which uh, a fathom is six feet. It was an anchorage. And it was an historic anchorage for a long time. And you can see the little anchor symbols that show that, that it is an anchorage. And they were scuttled at five fathom hole, and this is exactly where the cannon are located. Uh, just opposite and just a little upriver from Fort Jackson. Um, so the, the top panel shows five fathom hole where the cannon are located. And then the Rex channel where the rose is located. And the line of fire on, this, on the previous uh, slide showed that the, the angle from those uh, gun emplacements would put it there as well. And two, we're two miles down the river from the city of Savannah and you effectively can't uh, uh, fire into, you know, from the city two miles away. This is just a satellite photo showing the scuttling location of the transports and uh, the, uh, where we think the HMS Rose is at. We think it is now, I'm sorry, I should have taken this long, a long time ago. Um, we think it's under land, it could be under the core depot, which is the, uh, in the uh, left hand square, the, uh, the uh, you can see the white area, that's the uh, core depot. And we think that's where she's at. The city of Savannah is right uh, to the left, and then the scuttling location opposite Fort Jackson for the transports. Um, the cannon recovery, um, it, um, as uh, the video indicated, it was uh, conducted by commercial diving uh, and uh, marine services. Uh, several of the folks are here uh, in the audience, you may have noticed them. This is a shot from Fort Jackson. You can see the dive boat. The, uh, the channel marker up in the uh, upper right is actually uh, marks the site of the CSS Georgia, the Confederate ironclad. So they recovered them with lift bags. That, that video that they showed, that thing popping to the surface, that was pretty cool. Um, they towed them up to the city and uh, or up to the depot and raised them and transferred into tanks where they were all analyzed and documented. This Dr. Gordon Watts, he's a, uh, pretty much an expert on uh, cannon, along with Will Wilson documenting him. And so we, in documenting the cannon, we realize, and there's a total of 15 cannon. We, uh, we have two types. There's three long guns at 70 inches and 12 short guns at 60 inches. The long, the long guns are Armstrong style cannon. The, um, Short guns, we don't have any correlates for them. It's a, it's a strange gun. We've never seen it in the archeological record. We don't see it uh, historically uh, in any uh, images. Uh, and we're kind of perplexed on uh, where it may have been manufactured. They're both uh, six pounders. Uh, that means their bore is about three and a half inches um, in diameter. Here's a great shot uh, that kind of shows the difference in the two types of guns. Um, and we're, I would like to assume that they're all from the Savannah, but we can't say that for a fact, um, especially since there are uh, two, two different types and there are 15, whereas the uh, Savannah was a 14 gun ship. This is uh, just an image of that Armstrong style cannon. And these are in fact, uh, this, this gun is from the, uh, what's called the storm rack. And, as archeologists, you, go, you look for those correlates you, to compare and contrast your artifact types uh, in cannon or an artifact type. The storm wreck was off St. Augustine and uh, St. Augustine, Florida. And it, in fact, they surmised that it was one of uh, numerous British transports that were evacuating loyalists fleeing Charleston. 
and uh, Savannah had been evacuated several months prior to that. Charleston evacuated a little bit after a storm hit uh, when they were off the, the mouth of St. Augustine and sank a number of vessels. And we, uh, the folks who excavated this wreck seem to think this uh, uh, was a British transport, and it, and it matches our cannon to the T. Uh, approximately half the cannon were plugged with wooden plugs in their muzzle called a tampion. Here you can see the, uh, the uh, wood rings. Uh, mm -hmm. That effectively, the wooden plugs keep the moisture out, keep salt water out. Uh, they can be uh, armed, they can be, uh, they all probably still have cannonballs in them. Uh, do they have a sack of powder in them? That's unknown until they get to the conservation lab uh, to check it out. Uh, oftentimes they would put a ball in and kind of oil it up and put the plug in and as the ship rocked back and forth, the, the ball would slide up and down and, and keep the barrel clean uh, as you want all your, you know, even today your, your uh, barrels clean and whatever gun you're using. Um, the other things recovered, you saw the uh, uh, cannon shot recovered by some of the divers. There are, there's absolutely no other evidence of vessel down there, there are no, there's no rigging, there are no rudder parts, there are no, there's no wood, and it, um, it's kind of amazing uh, that there's nothing left. Although when you think about all the dredging that's gone on, and then there's the, uh, the Torito worm. It's actually a bivalve that eats wood down there, and it will just eat whatever shipwreck is down there, and it'll eat it till it's gone. Uh, so it's, it's not surprising. It's surprising, but it's not. Uh, the munitions, um, the circular bar shot right here up on the table. Some of you guys might have picked it up. Um, the problem with that is it's a, its diameter indicates that it's a four pounder. It's not from any of the cannon we have, but that's not necessarily uh, an oddity. Uh, uh, ships and shipwreck sites often have uh, munitions that don't fit their cannon. And the, the reasons for that can be multiple. They, they just, they've gotten rid of that cannon or they're brought on shot expecting to have the cannon or they're using it for ballast. Uh, three of our cannon, by the way, are broken. The muzzles are broken off. We do have one muzzle piece. Were those um, cannon broken by the dredge? Probably not. The cannon, when a cannon explodes, and, and it's not a, a, a it's, it's an often occurrence. It, it doesn't happen you know, totally often, but it's often enough that we had uh, several on the Georgia that were, uh, had, had their muscles blown off. The, um, they take those cannons and, and they, they're not usable and they put them in the hold as ballast. So were they used as ballast or we just don't know? Or, or were they broken by the dredge? The other uh, hemispherical shot, those are all six pounders. They're up here. Uh, we have two types. We actually have one that's a, that's a double. You can see it's a little bigger than the others, and it pulls apart and creates two rotating, uh, a much deadlier and effective um, uh, bar shot. And then the six pounder solid uh, shot that uh, fits the three and a half inch bore of all our cannon, uh, and it's most likely from our cannon. But again, these, you can't say for certain that these, the munitions are from these cannon and from the guns, but we're, there's a high likelihood of them being from our, our uh, vessel. The, um, where we're at now is research focuses on the HMB Savannah, uh, the 14 gun transport. We're, uh, we're looking for the uh, captain's log which would be the Royal Navy Lieutenant Richard Fisher. He, he manned that ship when it was scuttled. He went on to be a, a, a very successful uh, Royal Naval officer uh, commanding huge ships of the line, up to 70 cannon. Um, the, um, we think, and we're pretty certain that his log will be at the uh, Maritime Museum in Greenwich, England, along with possibly the Venus and um, the rows may be there. We're just we're just now into the research to, to uh, try and uncover those uh, uh, logs. Mm -hmm. And in conclusion, um, there's a total of 15 cannon recovered from the site. Uh, we don't 
there may be one or two that lay buried still, and maybe the dredge, dredging that's now ongoing may uh, uncover, we'll see. Um, we do know that they're from British troop transports that were scuttled September 20th. Um, possibly, most likely, most or all are from the Savannah. Uh, there are two types of cannon, all six pounders. Um, and it, once again, there's no rem other remnants of the vessels. And um, the archival research is ongoing. Um, we hope to get into the, uh, the archives in Britain. And then there's discussions ongoing as we speak about what to do with these cannons. Uh, cons conservation and curation. It's not a cheap thing, um, but these are very um, significant uh, arms. They helped, um, you know, they, they were part of one of the bloodiest battles of the American Revolution. I mean, what else can you say? As for the cribs, crib D has already been destroyed. Uh, we do have the documentation. Uh, Chris C will be fine. And, uh, and if you have any questions, um, we're ready to take uh, questions and answers. And then Andrea, did you want to say something about conservation? Yeah, okay, great. Conservation. There are still a lot of questions about that. So um, the cannons are technically under the jurisdiction of the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. Uh, we've been work working closely with the Office of the State Archaeologist on that uh, because without conservation, um, we need something to directly tie these guns to something. So we need uh, a distinguishing mark, continue the research. You know, we need that piece of information that is that direct link. So at the same time, we are also working with um, the British attache at the embassy in DC. They've been incredibly supportive. They're planning a trip down here. Um, so you know, hopefully with this research, we'll be able to definitively say um, who the cannon belong to. We're also working closely with the Georgia and South Carolina State Historic Preservation Offices. They've been incredibly supportive throughout this entire process. Um, with conservation, Steve mentioned it, it is very expensive, and the key to conservation is that you have to have somewhere for these cannons to go, and you've got to know, are they going to be stored? Are they going to be exhibited outside? You know, the way you can serve them depends on where they're going and how they're going to be used. Um, so we've been trying to partner with some local organizations to see if they can take some. Um, again, right now we're looking at a representative sample, the key and why we want to do that is to try and pick the ones that we think can link it back to a specific vessel. Um, and I will stop. I know that um, Sandra Baxter, if you would like to say a few words, especially we appreciate you hosting this event tonight. see you all here tonight. It's really great to see this many people from the community come out and learn about this. Um, I'm just I'm just really delighted that we were able to host this here. If you don't know, um, I'm Sandra Baxter, I'm CEO of Coastal Heritage Society. CHS op operates uh, six museums in Savannah. We have Pinpoint Heritage Museum, uh, Harbor Folks House, Old Fort Jackson, which you've seen, and then here in Tricentennial Park downtown we have Savannah History Museum, where we're sitting, uh, Georgia State Railroad Museum across the street, which also contains Savannah Children's Museum. And uh, as has been mentioned, the battlefield, uh, Battlefield Memorial Park is sort of the keystone piece of Tricentennial Park, where the Revolutionary War battle happened in 1779. It is through those doors and across the street, so we are literally sitting on part of that historic battlefield. So I think this is a great place for us to be able to gather and learn more about these guns. Um, so, you know, I found out about the three original guns probably like most of you did. Saw an article on CNN, I think. Um, and thought, wow, this is so exciting. Can you believe this? And uh, a couple of months, a few months pass, and uh, I get a call from Andrea, and she says, hey, remember those three guns? And uh, I was like, yes, how exciting. So would you be interested in taking them and uh, having them at one of your museums? And I was like, well, absolutely. So imagine my pause when she said, 
Yeah, we found 16, we think. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> so, of course, it's incredibly exciting. Um, we started having some conversations. I started having some conversations with my board. There was a lot to learn still at that point, so we kind of talked through the summer, through the holiday. And um, I'm very, very excited to report that I talked uh, with my board. We actually had our annual <coughs> retreat this last weekend, and Andrea and I have been able to come up with enough broad stroke um, lines, areas of agreement, that we felt that we could go ahead and come up with a memorandum, a memorandum of understanding. And I presented this concept to my board, and they have voted, <coughs> um, based on what we know today, for CHS to accept all of the guns, and we will put them on display here. Thank you. We're tremendously excited about this uh, opportunity, and because the battlefield is right here, you know, three times a week, we uh, three days a week, we offer a program where we take people out to Wales Liberty, we take them through the museum. We take them across the street onto the battlefield and really help our guests understand <clears throat> the events of that war here in Savannah. And this is a, it's an old train shed that we're sitting in. The museum is a long linear building with windows that face out onto the battlefield. And the idea is that we will be able to display these guns um, basically within those windows. So they will be sitting in a place where we can talk about them while you, over, while you see the battlefield before you go out onto the battlefield. So I think it's gonna be a really tremendous opportunity for us to expand the story of the revolution here in Savannah, not only what happened here on the battlefield, but uh, the naval story, which is very important as well. So I'm glad that uh, a couple times our <laughs> prior speaker mentioned the uh, cost of conserving cannons. Um, they're not all going to be conserved so we will be doing some fundraising for that. Um, there are 15 cannons. So there are 15 opportunities for you or your organization to sponsor a cannon. Um, I am further pleased to say that in the retreat this weekend, uh, our CHS board also committed, uh, has pledged the first of those cannons. So one of those is already pledged to be restored. So that was very grateful to our board for that. So, uh, thank you. I'm going to turn it back over if any of you or your organization are interested in helping us to conserve these guns and help us create exhibits to um, tell the story of what they are, why they're here, then please come talk to me after this is over. Great. Thank you. we understand but we want to allow some time for questions and I'm sure we'll all have to sit and <coughs> any questions from the group. Okay. In relation to the location of Fort Jackson, is the was the ironclad found a down channel or up channel? Uh, directly opposite. <laughs> so so, so um, Fort Jackson's on the south side. The CSS Georgia was on the north side of the channel, and there was uh, a thousand feet between them or so. Yeah, thank you. My name is Cody Cooney Chief. I'm Jeff Lumis, President of the Sons of American Revolution here in uh, Savannah. In your presentation, you mentioned the, uh, the French ships um, were hindered from attacking Savannah. Might offer a different history. They were hindered from helping America. Uh, I know the current SHEP project is taking the river from 42 to 47 feet. How deep was the river when these ships were originally scuttled? Well, it was called the Five Fathom Hole, so that was at least uh, 30 feet. Okay. Yeah, but no, there were uh, deeper areas as well. Yeah, much I mean, deeper. Uh, geo reference that goes maps, uh, the Big Gas Avenue is like 45 feet deep. Mm -hmm. I remember it was very deep. Yeah. But it was an area that was, um, you know, there weren't any shoals in it and it didn't, it didn't get any shallower. And that's, I, I believe, it was used as a uh, stored anchorage 
forever. Pardon me. Hi, if I may, I'm Aaron Bradford. I'm the interpreter supervisor and uh, resource education specialist with the Coast Area Society. And my understanding is that historically the Savannah River was about 12 to 20 feet deep, uh, depending on the tide, which made this natural harbor so important, so remarkable. Because any ships, for example, uh, the Union Ironclads coming up the river, for example, to attack Savannah, uh, if you get stuck at low tide in the river, then you're in a lot of trouble. So that's one of the reasons why we had soldiers out there on Salter's Island during the American Revolution. They had a Brooklyn fort. Uh, one of the reasons why was to defend this important harbor at Five Fathom Hole. So um, that's my understanding that historically it was 12 to 20 feet deep, except for Five Fathom Hole. Now, there might certainly be other places along the river, but the other thing is that Fort Jackson is on the most narrow point of the Savannah River. So that makes it a choke point. And so to defend that natural harbor, and also be a choke point made the ground where Old Fort Jackson stands so important. So if you're cordial invited to come out here, or I should say at Old Fort Jackson, we have daily cannon firings. And it's been such a thrill to see our partners out there and these sorts of things doing. So thank you. surface and they drilled through and they spiked they uh, they drilled holes through for both drill pins and then spikes on the sides uh, it's pretty amazing yes sir so is there any indication that the decision to, to scuttle the savannah was a was a quick decision it seems yeah. when you're expecting a, a french and american force uh, on your front that dropping 14 or so cannon to the bottom of the river with the force. Well, all, you know, I'm not an expert on the siege of Savannah. And, you know, my my um, understanding of history is often the projects that I'm involved in. <laughs> but you're correct uh, in the sense that all of the vessels were scuttled on the same day. So to me, that almost infers a quick decision. Yeah, especially if you compare it, I'm familiar with a little bit more with the the similar tactic at Yorktown and the York River, and, and Cornwallis pulled everything off of there. So while they found the ships, there were very few cannon or ammunition mm -hmm. or other things left. Mm -hmm. They cleaned them up pretty well. Right. And, and you know, sinking them with armaments kind of implies that it was a quick decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The commercial diving and marine services personnel here. Yeah. Uh-huh. And his uh, lovely plant, uh, family down in front, he's the president. Not family. And then uh, Rich, Rich Still, who uh, did most of the uh, heavy lifting. <laughs> We've got uh, Isaiah Gibbons over here. Yeah. Uh, Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, very much appreciated. Uh, you did a great job. Thank you. Isaiah did most of the uh, documentation of Chris. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you did the CSS Georgia, a lot of other things came up in the clamshell, like you know prehistoric shark teeth right. and mm -hmm. uh, Native American mm -hmm. artifacts. Did that happen with this as well? No. Okay. No. Not at all. You know, the, 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 the Georgia was kind of odd. Uh, you know, there were, there is the one of the largest prehistoric assemblages in, I believe, the state. Of the ceramics are just incredible. And why are they there? Bilbo Adams. Bilbo Adams. 
Well, exactly, which is no longer there, right? It's uh, curated in Georgia Southern Laboratory. Okay, another assemblage. What, what are you saying? No, well, the Texas A&M people think big, which is Georgia Oh, right, 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 yeah, right, exactly. They want the metal, they want but, the metal, but not the fire. But why is that, why were the, why is that prehistoric site in the middle of the river? It's, you know, it's, it's just downstream from Bilbo Mountain. Well, it's one of the oldest. It goes, it, well, that may be the answer. I've always scratched my head. Yes, sir. So when the dredging is completed on, on the current, how much further below where these cannons were found uh, will, will be the bottom at that point? And you mentioned that the